It is with great joy that I introduce Seth Baker. Uh, he is a member of our church. He's currently pursuing a master's in social work at Eastern New Mexico University. And he's also the leader of our Sacred Young Adults Ministry. Sacred is an acronym, stands for Seeking a Closer Relationship Every Day. They meet for Sunday school class here at the church from 945 till about 1045. And they have a Thursday night meeting at 7 at his home uh, that's just close by here. If you like information, uh, you can see him after the service or you can speak with me. And uh, we've just been so thrilled as a staff and as a church family to see how he's grown and to see his love for the Lord and helping mentor and discipleship uh, young folks, and they grow in their faith too. So it's with great honor that we welcome him. Let's give him a warm welcome, please. Well, good morning. I am so happy to be with my brothers and sisters this morning and to be talking about a topic that is a particular passion of mine, and that's apologetics. So we'll get into that, what apologetics is, here in a second. But first, I wanted to share a little story from my life that demonstrates uh, its importance to all of us. Several years ago, during my junior year at high school, I was desperate for something that all teenagers need. That's money. So like any teenager strapped for cash, I applied at every fast food joint within 100 square miles. I waited patiently for a call until one day, good old Kentucky Fried Chicken rang my number. I went in for an interview, and man, did I nail it. They were so impressed with me that they hired me on the spot and agreed to pay me an impressive $7.50 an hour with no benefits. I was on cloud nine. I couldn't even begin to think about what I was going to do with all the money I'd be raking in. But all joking aside, I was thrilled to have my first job, and I thank God for it. But little did I know that KFC would become a battleground for my faith, and that my time there would forever shape the rest of my Christian walk. <clears throat> my first day on the job, I met one of my managers, who we'll call John. John was short but built, covered in tattoos that he had gotten while in prison, and it was his task to train the newbie. I could tell how excited he was to show me the ins and outs of the fried chicken business whenever my greeting of, hello, sir, was, meted, was met with, don't call me sir. So we were going to hit it off. I just knew it. And you know what? We really did. John became one of my best friends ever. And it was largely due to him that I stayed working at KFC even after two years with no raise. Uh, despite my parents' protests, and in hindsight, I can kind of understand, <laughs> Despite my parents' protests against hanging around with a convicted felon, I drove John to work whenever he didn't have a ride, took him to his GED classes on Saturday mornings, and I sometimes hung out with his family. We had a great relationship, but there was one thing about John that really bothered me. John was an atheist, and he was an outspoken one at that. Now, if you're anything like I was at that time, atheists are kind of like the legend of Sasquatch. You've never seen a Sasquatch, but your crazy Uncle Jimmy swears he saw one one time. But standing in front of me on the first day at KFC, however, was a real, living, in-the-flesh atheist. And this atheist, though he would become a dear friend of mine, was about to tear some gaping holes in my faith in God. John had a knack for asking questions and bringing up objections that I'd never even heard before, let alone thought about and I found myself very quickly against the ropes in my faith. John would say things like this, If God's so good, why is there all this pain and suffering in the world? Or, The sentence of eternal hell just doesn't fit the crimes of sin. God, if he exists at all, is totally unjust. And again, The Bible's been changed so many times over the centuries that we have no idea what the original said. The bottom line is we can't trust a single word in it. John fired away, and the effects on my faith were devastating. From what I can remember, I struggled mightily with these questions and objections for weeks upon weeks. I struggled so much, in fact, that I eventually came to a sort of crossroads in my mind. I would either embrace some form of extreme blind faith and simply take a leap into the dark, or give up my belief in God altogether. If I took the first option, I would have to give up the idea that Christianity had any evidence whatsoever in support of it. And if the second option, I would be giving up the faith that had been my bedrock for so long. Even though I had attended church my whole life, 
I had no idea what to do, where to turn, or who to tell. But what I did know was that something was going to have to budge. Then, on my lunch break one day at good old KFC, in the midst of my crisis of faith, I was scrolling through YouTube and came across a video by the Christian thinker and defender, Dr. William Lane Craig. That video was on an argument for the existence of God. After the four-minute video was over, my heart exploded with joy. God exists, I yelled inside. I was stunned at the evidence for God that the video presented, and my weeks of agony were now, praise the Lord, happily over. This was all thanks to God using one person, Dr. William Lane Craig, who saw the desperate need today for something called apologetics. I owe much to the work of Dr. Craig, and I thank God for using him in his ministry in such a mighty way in my life. So what is this thing called apologetics, and is it biblical? Apologetics comes from the Greek word apologia, and we get our English word apology from it. Apologetics, however, is not saying you're sorry for being a Christian. Apologists, people that practice apologetics, aren't professional apologizers. In its original sense, the word apologia carried the meaning of giving a defense in a court of law, something a defense attorney would give. Put very simply, apologetics is the art of defending the truth of the Christian worldview using reason, logic, and God's word. Studying it will enable the believer to answer one of the most important questions of their spiritual lives. Why do I believe what I believe? We can see apologetics all throughout the New Testament. For example, the Apostle Peter exhorts believers to, quote, always be ready to give a defense, apologia, to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, 1 Peter 3.15. And the Apostle Paul confesses that he and the other apostles seek to, quote, demolish arguments and every high-minded thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God, taking every thought captive to obey Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5. Paul even set a requirement that elders, quote, be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it, Titus 1, 9. Likewise, Jude, the brother of Jesus, quote, found it necessary to write appealing to you, Christians, to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints, Jude 3. In the book of Acts in particular, which is a book that is chock full of apologetics and action, we find Paul going into a synagogue on the Sabbath, as was his custom, and reasoning with his fellow Jews, quote, from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, Acts 17, verses 2 and 3. And later in that very same chapter, we see Paul in the Areopagus, a court in ancient Athens proclaiming God's creation and Christ's resurrection to the Greek philosophers. Most importantly, though, all those people are great, Jesus himself engaged in apologetics. So we see in Matthew chapter 22, verses 23 through 32, Christ's masterful handling of a dilemma presented to him by the Sadducees. So if you would turn in your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 22, Matthew chapter 22, and we'll start reading in verse 23. The same day, some Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came up to him and questioned him. Teacher, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother is to marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first got married and died. Having no offspring, he left his wife to his brother. The same happened to the second also, and the third, and so to all seven. Then last of all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will she be of the seven? For they all had married her. Jesus answered them, You are deceived, because you don't know the scriptures or the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. Now concerning the resurrection of the dead, haven't you read that was spoken to you by God? <clears throat> I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. 
Now, I don't know about you, but me personally, if I was in Christ's situation, I probably would have sounded like a babbling idiot trying to respond to this seemingly powerful objection to the end times resurrection. But Jesus, being the masterful apologist he was, responded using reason, logic, and God's word to show the Sadducees the error in their dichotomy. It's not either deny Moses' authority or deny the afterlife, because there's a third option on the table. Namely, we won't be given in marriage at the resurrection. The Sadducees were guilty of a logical fallacy, presenting what's called a false dilemma. In verse 33, we read that the crowd listening was left astonished at Christ's answer. So if Christ is our perfect model of faith and practice, which he of course is, then we ought to seek to replicate his engagement in defending the faith from the attacks of the world. We could go into the Old Testament and see apologetics being utilized even there. But I think we get the point. Apologetics is thoroughly biblical and to engage in it is Christ-like. Okay, but why exactly do we need apologetics? I'm so glad you asked because I have conveniently prepared three answers to that question. It was a coincidence, I guess. So those answers are, one, apologetics will help you keep your faith in times of doubt, like it did for me. Number two, apologetics will help you share your faith more boldly and effectively. And three, apologetics will help you raise up the next generation of Christians into dedicated Christ followers who love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. So let's unpack these one at a time. Number one, apologetics will help you keep your faith. So, quick survey here. Has anybody here ever had any doubts? Okay. If you didn't raise your hand or say amen, then you're either God, shy, or deceived. And I think I know which one you're not. The fact is that we all have doubts, whether or not we admit it. And that's okay. There's no need to fear because we're in very good company. According to Jesus, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. But you know what? John the Baptist had doubts. That's right, the camel hair wearing, locust and honey eating, voice of one crying in the wilderness had doubts. Earlier in chapter 11 of Matthew, we read this. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Now, in more colloquial English, I'll translate that for you. Jesus, are you the Messiah or not? Because I'm sick of sitting in this prison cell and I don't want to be here for no reason. Now, how does Christ respond to John's question? Does he condemn him for his lack of faith? chastise him for daring to ask a question or tell him to stop thinking and just believe? No. Do you know what he does? He gives John evidence. That's right. He gives him actual evidence of his messiahship. Christ responds by saying this, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Matthew 11, verses 4, and six, 4 through 6. excuse me. Amazingly, it is after this episode of doubt that Christ calls John the greatest born of women. So it's okay to have doubts. But what is important is that you seek to give an answer to your doubts, just as John the Baptist did here. And this is where apologetics is so vitally important. We all have been and will be confronted with difficult questions about our faith, just as John the Baptist was. Why cancer? Why natural disasters? Why hell? Why unanswered prayer? And it is in these times that we can find help from apologetics. Dr. Craig, who helped me in my personal crisis of faith, writes this. When you're going through hard times and God seems distant, apologetics can help us to remember that our faith is not based on emotions, but on the truth, and therefore, you must hold on to it. Knowing that there are good answers to the problem of evil, good defenses of the doctrine of hell, and good reasons for having faith in Christ in general, 
will secure you in those dark nights of the soul, which are bound to come every now and then. For the sake of maintaining and strengthening our faith in the Lord, we need to learn how to defend it. Point number two, apologetics will help you share your faith. Sharing the gospel can be nerve-wracking. But let me tell you, it's even more nerve-wracking when you're unable to explain what you believe and why you believe it. In fact, some Christian brothers and sisters are so petrified of sharing their faith that they've given up on it entirely, being disobedient to Christ's command in the Gospel of Matthew to go and make disciples of all nations. I've even heard some Christians say, well, I just don't have the spiritual gift of evangelism. But here's a quick news flash. There's no such thing as the spiritual gift of evangelism. We are all, without exception, commissioned to spread the message of Jesus and make disciples. As the Christian author Mark Middleberg reminds us, evangelism and apologetics are not optional activities. They are at the very core of our mission, which is to reach our world with the gospel. That's why Jesus spelled it out so clearly, to go into all the world, including next door or down the hallway, to reach everyone we can for him. This great commission wasn't one choice among many. It's what we're here to do. Now here's a little fun fact for you because I have to pick on myself a little bit. Whenever I get really nervous for some reason, my tongue swells up and I start to talk like this. (laughs) So I don't know if you wanted to know that, but there's some info for you. Whenever I was at Eastern, I regularly did street evangelism on campus with uh, the BSU director, Dr. Dag Sewell. And I got to experience this wonderful phenomenon of a swollen tongue many times. And I'm sure some people were thinking, that poor guy needs to see a speech therapist. (laughs) I share that information because I know the feeling of anxiousness you get inside when you're speaking to people about a relationship with Christ. If only there were something that could enable us to become more confident witnesses for Jesus. There is apologetics. Being able to give a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you will calm your nerves, make you more courageous, and even change people's perception of Christianity as a whole. Not only this, but apologetics makes sharing the good news even more exciting than it already is. Sometimes when going out with Dr. Sewell, For street evangelism, I would secretly wish that someone would ask us a question they were struggling with so I could use what I had learned while studying. That, to me, appears supremely Christ-honoring, getting excited about sharing the wonderful reasons God has given us to believe in him and trust in him. Point number three, apologetics will help you pass your faith on. Many of you in church this morning have children, grandchildren, or maybe both, and I know that they're the pride of your life. There's nothing that would make you happier than seeing them pursue a lifelong, intimate relationship with God. On the other hand, however, there's nothing that would grieve you more than seeing them walk away from God. Sadly, according to recent studies, the state of the faith of our youth is one of crisis and a flood of heartbreak for many Christian and grandparents. Christian parents and grandparents has begun. A 14-year running poll by ABC News, which surveyed some 175,000 young people aged 18 to 29, revealed some very disturbing truths. From 2003 to 2017, the number of 18 to 29-year-olds who identify as non-religious increased 16%, up from 19% to 35% while the percentage of Americans over the age of 50 who identify as non-religious has only increased 5%. Now, both of those numbers are disheartening, but the increased percentage of non-religious young adults is just baffling. Another study by the PRRI found that 39% of young adults are religiously unaffiliated, four more percent than ABC News. And this percentage is over triple that of those of the unaffiliated rate among seniors. Amazingly, the study also found that there are 25% more young adults identifying themselves as religiously unaffiliated than the next largest religious identity, which is Catholic. This means that if being religiously unaffiliated were itself a religion, it would be the number one religion among young adults. 
Can you believe that? No religion is the largest religious identity for young people. That's just mind-blowing. These statistics are disturbing, to say the very least. If we do nothing to stop the bleeding, we run the risk of losing even more of our young people than we already have. So how do we combat this enormous problem? We combat this problem by really listening to our young people and answering the concerns that they have. In listening and conversing with them, we will discover that the concerns that they have stem from being unsure of the truth and the relevancy of their faith in a society full of competing worldviews. Young people are asking, is my faith true? And is my faith relevant in today's world? To my Christian brothers and sisters who are parents and grandparents, if we are able to articulate the wonderful reasons supporting our faith and make the eternal relevancy of our faith apparent to our young ones, then we will be able to pass on our faith. But if we are not able, then the statistics stand against us like a cresting tidal wave, and the future that they mark out for us is not a bright one. We must then, for the sake of the next generation of believers in Jesus, be people ready to give a defense for the hope that is in us. Apologetics, to quickly review, will help us keep our faith, share our faith, and pass on our faith to the next generation. So thus far, we have seen the what and why questions of apologetics answered. But many are probably and rightly wondering about the how question. Okay, this all sounds good, you might be thinking, but how do I do it? So let me share three steps that a Christian can take to start defending the faith to the glory of God. Number one, start by studying. Every believer should be equipped to give an answer to the question, why do you believe Christianity is true, that moves beyond their personal feelings or experiences. In a world that is increasingly relativistic, believing that all truth is a matter of opinion, feelings and experiences are a dime a dozen, and they will simply not cut it in the post-Christian America that we live in now. While it is true that America has never been less Christian in its history, it's also true that there have never been more wonderful resources for defending our faith. We are living in a time when apologetics has experienced a renaissance of popularity. In recent years, the markets have been flooded with websites, books, and even movies, like The Case for Christ, all on topics in apologetics. In fact, there's so much great material that we might have another problem on our hands. Where to start? So like many of you, I'm only a beginner in apologetics, so I can't speak from authority. But here's the first piece of advice for budding apologists. Find an introductory book and read consistently each day. I've got a couple here that I'm going to show you guys. You would be amazed at how much material you can cover in reading only 10 to 20 minutes a day. In fact, if you read only 10 minutes a day but were consistent, <clears throat> you'd be able to read around 10 books in a year. If 20 minutes a day, 20 books a year. And if you kept on consistently, you'd soon have dozens and dozens of books under your belt, the contents of which you'd be able to share with believing and non-believing family, friends, neighbors, and coworkers. I think a good place to start, which I'll show you guys, would be with Gary Habermas and Michael Lacona's book, The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus. So that is Gary Habermas and Michael Lacona. This book will be out on a table whenever we're done, so don't worry about writing everything down. And I would follow that with Gregory Kokel's book, Tactics, which is a conversation guide as to how to share your faith effectively. And there'll be more outside. If any of y'all know me, you know I love books, so there's no shortage of books out in the foyer. Rome wasn't built in a day, and becoming a prepared apologist doesn't happen overnight. But with time and diligence, you will become a studied and competent defender of Christianity. And let me add this on as well. You can't defend the faith if you don't know the faith. We have to be in the word of God and know what God's message is, what his truth is, before we can ever hope to defend it. So if you're not already reading your Bible regularly, then I would do that before you even think about beginning defending the faith. But with those two things coupled together, that's wonderful. All right, number two, prepare by praying. So pray regularly. 
that God would give you a heart of humility and love for others, remembering that the reason we seek to give a defense is not to prove others wrong and ourselves right, but to honor the Lord and bring others into a relationship with him. After growing in knowledge of apologetics, you might be tempted to fall into pride. We mustn't allow an arrogant spirit to overcome us as servants of Christ. We have to keep the ultimate end in mind, helping others to know Jesus as Savior and King. Apologetics is not the end. It's never to be studied in and of itself. It is merely the means to an end, proclaiming the gospel. And if we forget this, then we've lost the plot entirely. If apologetics isn't done in love, then it shouldn't be done at all. Number three, spread by sharing. So thirdly and lastly, look for opportunities to share the things you've learned with those around you. Family, friends, neighbors, coworkers. If you're reading something interesting or think that someone would benefit from hearing about a book or an article you just read, don't be afraid to share it with others. If you do share, you'll be in a perfect position to start an intentional conversation about Jesus. It might sound something like this. Hey, I've been reading on an argument for God's existence recently. Did you know that there's wonderful scientific evidence that the universe has been designed? What do you think? Does the universe have a purpose? If not, why are we here? And if so, what is the purpose of our lives? Then you're off and running, and the conversation will flow from there. God will be with you as you share. Sharing also includes sharing on social media. It was on social media, if you remember the story about my crisis of faith, that I first encountered apologetics. Don't underestimate the value of making a Facebook post or a Snapchat video or a tweet that has apologetics relevance. It's a great way to reach others that you otherwise wouldn't come into contact with very often. So practicing apologetics starts with these three steps, studying, praying, and sharing. Keep this up and you'll soon be a seasoned vet at defending the faith. I do have to leave you with a warning, however. Once you start, you'll never want to stop, but that's a great thing. So I want to challenge you. Think of some people in your life that would be benefited by hearing about the wonderful evidence that there is for God. Pray about it and then prepare about it by getting an introductory book and studying it 10 minutes a day. It's all it takes for 10 books a year and imagine the rigorous apologist you'll be with a dozen books under your belt. So, uh, as we conclude, let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you, God, for the great reasons you've given us for faith in your son, Jesus, that you don't demand us to have a blind faith, but that you give us a reasoned, believable faith, Lord. We thank you, God, for, uh, Lord, apologetics and its role, Lord, in maintaining our faith and, and enabling us to share the gospel more boldly with others. And I pray, Lord, that everybody leaving uh, this morning would just be impressed with its importance. And we love you so much. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.